What up, y'all? Welcome back to episode three of All the Smoke, coming to you from New York. We got a special guest today that I'm very excited to talk to, someone that I've just kind of learned so much from uh, from social media, someone who is a real leader in our community when it comes to social justice. Wipe your hands real quick. No, actually, today, good? I got you. Look. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're a little more more serious than mine today. Hey, <laughs> hey, man, we got a special guest, man, Sean King, man, the people's champ. This is pop. I can't say enough good things about this dude, but kind of pop culture's go-to guy for social justice, social activism, um, a positive voice, a real voice. Uh, it's good to have you here, man. I appreciate it, man. man thank yeah, you for good coming to see you, through, bro. Also, a, also an educator, because yeah. you know, a lot of stuff that go on, you educate a lot of people when they don't know what they're talking Absolutely. about. You know, my first job out of college was as a teacher, and so much of what I do is still from that training, trying to just teach and break stuff down. So yeah. that's a lot of what that's I do. That's good, and, and people need to be susceptible. I mean, we know uh, pretty much what you're about, and we're going to get into that to detail, but what I kind of want to tap into, I'm excited personally just to kind of get to know Sean King, the person, you know, yeah. not the person that is, you know, the, the social justice fighter that we all know and love, but, you know, your upbringing and, 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 and what got you going into this space. Tell us a little bit about oh, that. Oh, man, yeah. I mean, I, you know, social media is weird like that because it kind of reduces us to little sound bites and tweets and we're all way more nuanced and complicated than our best Instagram right. posts. Mm -hmm. So I, I grew up in rural Kentucky, and we're all about the same age. And so I grew up in the 80s in a small town right outside of Lexington. Okay. So I grew, grew up a huge basketball fan, okay. big UK fan. You didn't have no choice. You had <laughs> in the UK, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, there were some Louisville fans, yeah. <laughs> you know, around. Right. But um, Did you? No, not at all, man. No, not. I can't even play a game of horse. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But uh, so I grew up, man, it, when I think about the way I came up, you know, I, my mother was a single parent, hardworking, working class white woman who worked in a local factory there in the town. And I was a product of a interracial relationship. And in this town, like that was unheard of. No. Yeah, like I'm born in 1979. And in the 80s, growing up, looking the way I look from the from the relationship I came from, it was weird. Like this was before being mixed or biracial. I didn't even have that language. Right. Like this was before any of that was cool. Mm -hmm. And so in the town I grew up in, I never even saw myself as mixed or multiracial. I was black. Like that's if you what grew up in this that, town. Interesting. What age did you realize you're a black man? Because I'm similar. I'm Italian and black, but. I knew at 17 from a particular instant that I was a, looked at as a black man. Well, here's, man, I have a book that comes out in April and I tell this whole story. So in my house, my mother never talked to me about race. And I try to tell people like, in a white household, we had like a very low racial IQ. Like my mom wasn't trying to school me on race or racism. So I was in second grade when two young black girls in the school who were friends of mine for life came up to me and asked me if I was mixed. And I remember, like, I've played it cool my whole life, but I remember being so confused when they were like, are you mixed? And they were giggling. What they wanted to know, and I didn't understand this till years later, was they wanted to know if it was okay for them to think I was cute because their parents had taught them, okay. don't mess with white boys at the school. Mm. So they wanted to know, are you mixed? <clears throat> and so in second grade, I start realizing like, oh, I'm different. And by the time I got to middle school, like I went from thinking, okay, I know I'm different to, oh, I'm black. Like I'm sitting at the, the black table, my girlfriends are black, all my friends are black. By the time I get to high school, I, I've told this story before, um, it was a whole, it was a whole nother monster. Like the town was super segregated and there was just major racial strife in the high school. And so, I mean, we were being called the N word. I had a redneck one time throw a jar of tobacco spit in my face. Mm -hmm. Like we were dealing with full on bigotry. Mm -hmm. In 1995, like this was, I was 14 at the time. 
1995, I got beaten so badly by a group of racist white students. I missed my whole sophomore and junior year of high school recovering from those injuries. Mm. And that shaped the, the rest of my life. Like, I don't even know, like, so I hate that that happened. I had three spinal surgeries, fought my way back to recovery. But had that not happened, I don't even know that you would know me. Like, I was not on the path to fighting for social justice or civil rights, but going through all of that impacted me so deeply yeah. that this fight for justice became a huge part of my life. And so from 1995 on, I've always been not just fighting for civil rights, but I've always had a huge heart for people that are hurting, for people that experience injustice. But even through all of that, I mean, I've always sometimes just been at this weird spot when it comes to race. You know, in, in this country, uh, we haven't always had the nuance for people who operate in multiple worlds, you know? Right. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, it's a similar upbringing. Like I said, I'm Italian and black. Um, so I was never black enough and I was never white enough. You know what I mean? And I went through stuff in elementary school where they'd be calling me nigger, so I would fight them. And so I really didn't get a chance to show who I was until, you know, I was, I was bigger, obviously, but they would never let me play at recess and the girls didn't look at me like me because I went, my parents, although I was, you know, mixed, they always put me in white schools, mm. you know what I mean, just for whatever reason it may have been. So I would go through racial stuff and it was just like, okay, and, and I was proud to say, okay, I was always mixed, I was always mixed, I was always mixed until my senior year of high school where a kid had spit in my sister's hair and called her a nigger. And as she came up and told me after class, I happened to see the dude walking by, so I did what a big brother does. And I ended up getting suspended. <clears throat> and during my suspension, the KKK came up to my school and just vandalized it, burned down the bathroom, hung my football, a, a mannequin with my football uh, jersey on it, dyed nigger, swastikas everywhere. And it was really at that point where I'm just like, okay, although I'm very proud to be Italian, I'm black. And this, right. people look at me as, as being black. Right. And that was in like this the time society, after, this like, you can't, right. you can't proudly be mixed. As right. many mixed kids as there are, like if you have black in you, you're black. And that's yeah. how people look at you as black. It's, you know, from, it's wild that you experienced that, man, because that's one of the first times I've heard of a story of somebody experiencing something like that, because in 1993, I got into a same thing. We were always in like horrible racial fights. Mm -hmm. And um, I got into this horrible fight at a football game. And the next week, the school banned, the high school that I went to banned Confederate flags. Mm. And when they banned these Confederate flags, there was a huge walkout of white students who, were, who wanted their Confederate right. flags. Well, I got suspended because of the fight that I was in. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to school after they had banned those Confederate flags, like white students at the school saw me as the reason they banned those Confederate flags. So the heat and the pressure was on me from that point forward. Mm -hmm. And it, it forced my identity, you know, at least in this town, I didn't have the experience of not being black enough. Like black folk in this small town just accepted me with open okay. arms. Okay. And so, I've seen even with some of my own children, depending on on their tone of sometimes feeling like they don't quite fit in. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of New York is that everybody can blend in in New York. And so my kids, people don't know if they're Puerto Rican or Dominican right. or whatever, right. so they all they always fit in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's transition a little in a, in a little different path with, um, you know, obviously we'll get to the Kaepernick situation, but I think as far back as um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, you fast forward to, and uh, people that don't get enough credit in, in spoken about is Craig Hodges, Yo, is, yeah, uh, Mahmoud Abdul-Rauf, guys who lost their crew and, and were pretty much ousted black balls, so to speak, from the NBA, to LeBron James really taking athletes' platform and, and, and giving us a voice that traveled worldwide. What are your, what are your thoughts? as far as sports and basketball in particular right now? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think LeBron has changed the game for a lot of people. And I mean, he, he went so strong with it that it's given a lot of people permission, like in so many ways, because he's 
the face of the league and one of the right. most known athletes in the world, when he stands up for social justice, it makes it easier for all the other players right. to do so. I think I thought that was going to happen with Colin Kaepernick in the NFL. Like, I know he was not at the peak of his career when he took a knee, mm -hmm. but I think I thought that when he took that stand that he was a big enough name and had been successful enough that it wouldn't cost him his career. Right. Like, imagine the NBA equivalent of Colin Kaepernick, whatever that we could think of whatever who that, that is. Right. Yeah, like a, you know, a, a success, super successful player basically being banned from the NBA. Well, that's, that's Mahmoud abdul Rauf. Right. you know? Like, as progressive as we think the NBA is now, and it's a lot, it's the best no it's ever been. No question. It wasn't that way just 20 years ago. Mm -mm. Like, most, like even when I had to teach my son, like, son, these two guys, Craig Hodges and, and Mahmoud abdul Rauf, that I loved as a kid. Like, I, I watched Chris Jackson play for LSU, and we loved this guy. Like, man, these guys had their careers ruined. And it's hard for this new generation to realize that in some ways, both of those guys, Craig Hodges and Mahmoud abdul Rauf, they are still kind of actively banned from the league. The league still won't touch them. Mm -hmm. And um, I've talked to both of those brothers, and it's it's still painful for them. So it it's kind of like there's two streets right now where the NBA is super progressive for these current players, mm -hmm. but you get these former players who still feel very hurt no and left behind by it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm proud that the NBA has given brothers the space to kind of speak their piece, right. but. Um, I mean, there's still room to grow for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Mike Moon is still playing in the big three, and right. that's done a lot for him. Because oh, yeah. People that didn't know him, they learned a lot about him now from, from the success he's had in the big three, right. and they're, they're, they're able to learn his story now. You know, and then when a lot of people seen him, that was a big thing for the big three because a lot of people wonder where did he go, what happened to him. So to right. see him still in great shape at 50, to still be one of the best shooters in the big three, right. like it, 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 it was, it was a... It was refreshing for him to get back on that stage. Yeah, and it proved right away. It's like, oh, he definitely should have been in oh, the league. No question. Like no, this notion that one of the best peer yeah. scores ever. Well, you yeah. know, they, they start making memes of Steph Curry before Steph Curry. Yeah. They were showing his picture. Oh, right, he right. Killer. But he could have he could have played another ten active seasons. No question. And you see him in the big three, and you realize like, oh, they cut ten years of this yeah, man's easy. career mm -hmm. off. You know. What do you think about? LeBron being so outspoken and then Michael Jordan not really wanting to take that. I mean, I know that's an individual, if you feel comfortable, speak on it. But what are your thoughts when someone such as Jordan has a platform and LeBron has a platform and we have one guy doing it and one guy not? Well, you know, so I, I grew up as a kid, just a young kid, like a huge super fan of Michael. Right. And so like when things like the L.A. riots and the Rodney King beating happened, I didn't understand how pissed people were that Jordan wasn't speaking out. But like, if there was social media back then, there would have been trending topics about his silence. Like, he he wouldn't touch it. But at the same time, it was, there's a part of me, I don't mean to say that wants to give him a pass, but he was, I, I think he understood or at least believe that his calculation was, if I speak out on this, it could jam up my career. Now there's another part of me that looks at MJ in his prime and thinks, man, you could have said whatever, whatever you, you wanted. wanted. Whatever you like, wanted. he was, him. we almost have to go back in time. I mean, he was at one time the single most popular human being on, on the, the planet. planet. Not just athlete, like he was, he could do no wrong. Right. And so had he spoken out against police brutality, then mm -hmm. damn it, he'd have just spoken out against police brutality. Right. So he could have ushered that in. You know, I don't know the calculations that caused him to think it was too risky. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I remember a few years ago where Le LeBron wasn't speaking out on police brutality and social justice like he is now. This young boy in Cleveland, Tamir Rice, 12 years old, had just been shot and killed. And it took over the whole city of Cleveland, the whole country. And this is in 2014 at like the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. And they had put a mic in front of LeBron's face and asked him what he thought about it. 
and he basically said he didn't know anything about the case, which was, I thought one of two things at the time, and I put him on blast on social media for it. If he really didn't know anything about the case, then that's crazy because it was right there in his city and it took over the whole city. Or he kind of froze in that moment and didn't want to see anything, didn't want to say anything. <clears throat> and the pushback that he got from that, I'm not saying it was the pushback that caused him to say, I need to do more. But it but was he, the pushback yeah, that caused him to say, I need to do more. Yeah, I mean, I think he felt like it, even Tamir's family was hurt by it. Mm -hmm. And I think when he saw that, I think it stung. And at this, I, I, I've worked with hundreds of guys in the NBA and NFL. What I know is every day brothers are making these quick calculations about what's okay to say, what's not, what's not okay. And um, I think whatever LeBron messed up on a few years ago, he has more than made up for it over no these course. past few no years. Course. Like even when I see him just after the game, loving on young brothers and, and, and showing new players moves and all like, even when I look at old school players like Jordan, even before them, like they weren't even seeing themselves as like mentors of the young guys. Yeah, he's league. different. Mm -hmm. he yeah, he's totally yeah. different. Yeah, different. I mean, old school man, you just you played the game and left right. the court. Right. And so I think, but I think LeBron changed that in a lot of ways. It just now the older generation is kind of mentoring the younger generation. So it's it's a good thing. As athletes are kind of people expect LeBron to speak up on stuff and and Steph and Kyrie and the names go on. I've always wondered why people don't look at Tom Brady, GOAT status, right. Hall of Famer, right, best quarterback ever. Why don't people look to Tom Brady to, to speak up on stuff like that, you think? That's a good question, man. I mean, Tom Brady, if you think about it, Tom Brady is, he is the Michael Jordan. No question. In, in terms of his, his skills, his titles, and his almost near silence on anything social, be it be it Donald Trump, be it racism and bigotry, like you gotta, you, you gotta really twist that man's arm to get him to even hint that he cares about any social issues in the world. And I think in a lot of ways, white athletes get a major pass on not just issues related to, to Donald Trump, but white supremacy itself. And it, it, it kind of begs this idea that white supremacy is uh, an issue that black folk only are supposed to speak out on and, and the, the opposite is true. Like if, if Tom Brady and white athletes spoke out more on bigotry and racism and white supremacy, they could actually impact the people who are advancing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, those guys are completely silent, mm -hmm. man. So you know, Tom gets a complete pass, but mm -hmm. there was Kyle Korver. Yeah. Wrote that open letter that I yeah. thought was amazing. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, there's a, a guy, the relief pitcher for the Washington Nationals um, who just won the World Series, uh, Doolittle. Mm -hmm. um, he was the first guy to say he wasn't gonna go to the White House when the Nationals right. were invited there. But he penned this, uh, this op-ed on why he wasn't going to the White House. And he gave about like 14 or 15 reasons on why he just couldn't do it and be with his wife the next day or be with his family the next day. And um, the World Series MVP, Rendon, he didn't go. And so you have some white athletes who are doing it. And uh, Doolittle even said in that op-ed, like he mentioned uh, uh, Long and others of saying like, hey, there's some other white guys that mm -hmm. kind of came before me. And so I see it now as my responsibility. Mm -hmm. But Tom Brady is, he's a ghost. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, he, I mean, he could he could do more. He could but further he the movement, you know what I mean? And to me, to be fair to these people, to Mike and Tom and, and whoever, it's always been about being comfortable. Just because you have a platform, you may not be comfortable. You may not be versed in the subject. You may not want to say anything for whatever your reasons. But to me, like I think there's enough athletes now that are utilizing their platform. We can always use as many as possible. We can always use more races, uh, different races, obviously white and, and whoever else speaking up on it but to me it's something you have to be em embraced and something to be comfortable with sure, go sure. On. you know what I mean yeah I mean I, I try to see each of these guys and like you said including Tom or others <clears throat> these are people and mm -hmm. I, you know it's easy for us to to reduce any of these athletes as 
something other than just a just a human Human being right and um and some sometimes with a guy like thomas that he might not know but i i still refuse to give him a pass i mean there are many issues like he he said a little bit in defense of colin kaepernick Mm -hmm. but that's about the most i've ever heard him say you know we know that you know you're kind of being an athlete i know i reached out to you personally a couple times athletes come to you and 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 discuss obviously this or maybe something they're going through and and what are some of the messages you give to them and you hope they get from that because you say early on you you know you, you have an act a, a background in education you know so you're always educating what, well, what it, dep- it depends on when it depends on when guys come to me like there there are probably three scenarios where guys come to me from from all sports one is a guy's in trouble and he's he is he has said something or done something problematic and he's now trending on Twitter mm-hmm. and people have said hey you need to go talk to Sean King and and he'll talk you through this and I'm okay with that like that's helped me build trust with guys because they understand that if they come to me if there's a there's an NBA player who says something d- during like the height of police brutality a few years ago, and he just he says something really dumb on Twitter, and uh, he was the top trending topic in the country, and he came to me and was like, he just didn't understand what he said that was wrong. He said something in effect of like, you know, if if we handled our situations better with police, there wouldn't be as much police brutality or something, and people were just flaming him on social media, so. I, my job is to kind of educate him behind the scenes without anybody ever knowing what that conversation is about and trying to say like here's what you said that was wrong here's Mm -hmm. why it was wrong here's why people are pissed Mm -hmm. and i get that every few days man Mm -hmm. of a guy who tried to wade into something and just missed the mark in part because nobody schooled them or educated them on it um i get guys who are asking like how do they use their influence on an issue to make a difference in their in the city they play in or in their hometown where they grew up in and that's a different situation where i'm trying to help brothers understand like here's how you could be a creative foundation or weigh in on social issues that matter and um and then one of the things that i get that surprises me is i get players who often are asking me to introduce them to some other athlete. And I think people have this assumption that all athletes know each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And particularly, like, I found that in in the NFL in particular of it's a brutal sport. And, like, even in in the NBA where you guys are on the court seeing each other, talking with each other, no helmet, and it's, it's competitive, but it's not physically as brutal as the mm-hmm. NFL. Most NFL guys, if you didn't go to college with these guys, you're not talking team versus team. So a lot of times I'm introducing NBA players to NFL players or even guys within the league because they don't really know each other. And there's mm-hmm. not, I think people think there's like a, a directory and, uh, and there's not. And so sometimes I try to be the bridge between players. You mm-hmm. know? What about now, I mean, moving the cap? Someone you've obviously, be, you know, become close with and, and talked to. And to me, when it first happened, like you said, I thought it was going to be monumental and all the players were going to do it. And it, it was really pro that for a while, but then kind of the trickle down effect and possibly be people understanding that, okay, well, if I do this, am I going to lose my career? Am mm-hmm. I going to lose my livelihood? What, what was your thought? on the overall situation with that? Well, you know, before before I knew him personally, I was a fan. Like, I, I watched him, admired him, watched them go to the Super Bowl. They were literally a, a play away, a few yards away from winning the Super Bowl. And uh, in uh, 2015 and 2016, he reached out to me when there were several issues of police brutality. And I saw this was... Twitter was even smaller back then. This was before Trump's election even. And um, we just started talking through Twitter DM and he would ask me to explain a a certain case of police brutality or ask me what I thought. 
but he wasn't even really tweeting about it. But it, this was before before he ever took a knee, before people understood what was going on in his head. And um, he had had several injuries that ended that season. And I think, and I know you guys have experienced this, like during that injury, it just was a real reflective period for him. Like during the grind of a season when you're not injured, it's hard to think about anything other than the but, game. Mm -hmm. And he had this period for the first time in his whole adult life where he wasn't playing and he was just able to kind of think through the issues. And that summer, there were three different brutal police killings of a man named Terrence Crutcher in Oklahoma, Philando Castile in Minnesota, and then Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge. And we forget it, but then there was, in response to that, there was a brother in Louisiana and a brother in Dallas who started shooting police officers. Mm -hmm. And that summer was so volatile. And Colin and I were, were messaging and talking several times a day at that point. And he was at a preseason game and he didn't tell anybody I don't even think he told his partner, anybody, he was going to do this. Just when they played the national anthem, I think he had just a personal human moment where he heard it, and it was just like, I'm not standing up for that. But, that, but all of that stuff was going on. It was literally the week that all of that was going down. And then he, and, but no one noticed. And then he did it the next week where he wasn't taking a knee. He just didn't, he was like, I'm not standing up for it. And a lot of people felt like that, like the anger in the country was high. Right. And, um, but when people noticed that he wasn't standing for the anthem, uh, that then put him in a, they, they put a mic in front of his face. And I think the country learned like, oh, this brother's brilliant. He's thought it through. And right away he became like an instant cult hero for people. And I talked to these families, the family of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, and they, they needed somebody like that. Mm -hmm. So like when they heard Colin speak about their issue, like for them, it mattered. Right. And um, when the season started and he took a knee in an official NBA game, NFL game during the anthem, it was a huge deal for families who had experienced police brutality. Mm -hmm. It was, and it was a huge deal, I think, for people who were fighting against police brutality and fighting for justice. And yet I don't think he did it to spark him. Like he did it for himself. Right. Like that's how he felt. And he had a couple of brothers on the team on the 49ers who did it with him. Those guys were his friends. And yet I think I hoped that other guys around the league were gonna do it. I wish they had. If had everybody taken a need and you, could, say? Yeah, you couldn't do anything. What could you know? they say? And um, I never imagined as he continued to do it throughout the year, even as Donald Trump started talking about it, as Fox News started talking about it, I didn't imagine it would cost him his career. Like I, I don't think he thought that either. Um, I believe he would have done it anyway. Like having talked to him through this, mm -hmm. I think even if he believed that was the consequence, I think he still would have done it. But he didn't believe that was going to happen. And, and he was 29 years old. I mean, this was a guy who had a age, you know. Yeah, this this was a guy who 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 still has to this day several records in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And the notion that he would basically be cut and never allowed back into the league Incredible. seemed preposterous. Right. Mm -hmm. And the price he's paid, I'm a lifelong NFL fan. And I just couldn't, I, to this day, I can't bring myself to watch it because one, because I know this guy, but the notion that this league has effectively ruined his career in the prime of, in, the, in his youth, in the prime of his life, I can't get over it. And so I'm, I'm stuck on that. It was frustrating to me because when Trump and Fox News started getting involved, it wasn't he was protesting the flag. That was just the vehicle he used to get his message across at the time. He was protesting stuff that we all know is an issue, but they turned it into 
you don't respect our soldiers and this, this and that. And as many people as, you know, they try to say, you know, you're disrespecting. I would see tons of, you know, vets across social media that are for CAP. Oh, yeah, all the time. You know, all we, the time. We deal with CAP. Yeah. You know, and we yeah. serve so, 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 so. So it was really frustrating to me to see that the way the media was able to spin that and make it him against. Yeah, him well, they're masterful at that, man. That and the key. I think if, <clears throat> if Trump has one superpower, it's kind of diversion of if there's one issue going on. Sleight of hand. Yeah, he, he, he's a sleight of hand magician, mm -hmm. man. He's mm -hmm. masterful at it. And I... I don't think anybody could reasonably make the argument that this was him protesting the flag. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, but when you get loud voices to say that's what it was, people bought it, man. Right. And, um, you know, I think the NFL, the NFL Players Association even, I mean, there were a lot of people that I thought should have gone harder for him that pretty much bailed on him. And I had several brothers in the league mainly older veterans who had kind of already made most of the money they were going to make talk about the possibility of of doing deeper protests or trying to get people to sit out the season but it just never picked up momentum right. and um you know i think i think a lot of players are going to look back on how they abandoned cap at a time where they should have stood with him. I don't think they'll feel good about it. They had it. a great opportunity to yeah. do something real big. Yeah. You know, we're following in his footsteps, but they didn't take advantage nah, of it. Nah, and you know, it's, I mean, but here, I, had a, I had a lot of guys, I and mean, I had full on arguments with brothers in the league when this was going down. And I had guys tell me things like, listen, just as I said earlier, I don't know him. He didn't, he didn't talk to me about this before he decided to do it. I had guys, as most guys in the league don't have any guaranteed money in the NFL. Mm -hmm. So when guys saw, particularly in the second season, when he was fully banned basically from the league, guys were spooked. Mm -hmm. And if they were going to do something, it probably needed to be during that first season when he was still in the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the moment in which players saw, oh, they're going to ban him, they should have responded in mass right away. They wouldn't really, they wouldn't really sac no. sacrifice their job. No, and I mean, I talked to guys that I felt, I mean, I had guys tell me like, Sean, if I miss one paycheck, right. it's gonna jam up my whole, my whole family, my whole system. Mm -hmm. And guys, when they saw a guy of Collins caliber basically get banned, it had the effect the NFL wanted it to have. Mm -hmm. It spooked guys from following in those footsteps. To shut up and play. Yeah, so the only guys who did it were guys that were just different. Like, Reed. yeah, Eric Reed. Eric Reed's different, yeah, man. He uh, is different. Uh, Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> yeah, different. Like, these guys, are di these guys, Kenny Stills, these guys, they already were different before they got in the game. Mm -hmm. And, and so those guys already kind of marched to the beat of their own drummer. The rest of the guys just looked at him and was like, I can't take that risk. And that's exactly what the NFL wanted to happen. Yeah. And uh, it was a moment had half the league, a third of the league, just said, listen, we're not playing until he comes back. It would have been one of the biggest moments in sports history. Yeah, I agree. And instead, brothers just kept on playing. And uh, I get it. I understand it. But there was a real missed opportunity there, you know. Yeah. What do you What are your thoughts about Jay Z and his partnership with the NFL? You know, I was someone initially looking in. Like Jay has always kind of been the voice of the people for me. You yeah. know what I mean? He's yeah. always been that guy. So to me, when people were knocking him, I was first when I, when it first came out. I was saying, you know, we to affect change, you have to be a part of change. We needed a seat at the table. And to me, what that seemed like was Jay had a seat at the table not knowing how much power or what his actual, actual job or objective was, that he had a seat at the table and we need to kind of sit back and wait to see what happens. What, what are your thoughts thus far on the whole situation? Because it, it's been a while now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love, first <laughs> off, I love Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. I love him. And just like you, like, I've admired him for a very right. long time. And I've also, I've been behind closed doors and have seen him support families and causes that people never knew about. And I mean, he, he raps about generosity being something he does in private. And I've seen that. And, and 
I think in any other circumstance, had Colin Kaepernick not been currently banned from the league, if I saw Jay Z say, "Oh, he's gonna he's gonna become some type of partner here," if if what the NFL did to Colin Kaepernick never happened, great move. I'd have been like, "Oh, okay, yeah." Great move. But we live in real life, like. Colin Kaepernick is currently actively banned from this league. And Colin has never spoken out about Jay-Z, and that's not his way. But I know many of us who are close to Colin felt like, I felt like Jay-Z played Colin directly. Jay-Z and Colin met several times throughout that previous year. Jay, Jay Ward a, a jersey to a Colin jersey to a, to a concert. Mm -hmm. And that whole time, he was also meeting with Roger Goodell. And Cap was or Jay-Z was? Jay-Z was. Mm -hmm. Jay-Z had at least four meetings with Roger Goodell over the year before he struck this deal. And so I'm not, and listen, it's Jay-Z's business if he wants to strike a deal, but that he was kind of bargaining with Roger Goodell at the same time while he was hanging out with Colin and defending him, it just seemed underhanded to me. Like, I wish he would have, had, Colin never knew about it. He never mentioned it to Colin, never talked to him about it. And um, I think it, it wouldn't have hurt the deal had he just spoke with Colin and said, man, I, I'm gonna try to go inside and impact it from the inside out. And when I get there, here's what I hope to do. What's your input? But I think Colin was blindsided by it. And mm -hmm. so, like, here, here's the thing. Like, even just as well as I know the two of you, if, if a corporation had done you super, I mean this in real life, if a corporation had done one of you super dirty, I just can't rock with it. Mm -hmm. Like, even as little as we've known each other, I care about each of you enough to where if they did you wrong, I'm gonna have to think twice about that. And no corporation has done a man worse than what the NFL has done to Colin Kaepernick. Right. And I think when Jay-Z, when he had the press conference, I've, I felt like he, it, it seemed like he, hadn't done, he didn't do any prep for it. Like he was surprised by basic questions and his, like some of his talking points bothered me. Like it was like, I didn't even know if he had thought this thing through. And when you really look at as much as we know about the deal, I don't even think the deal is that deep. I think it's a music contract. It's, a, it's an entertainment deal. And Jay-Z and Rock Nation get a little bit of input on social justice stuff, but I'm not seeing the fruits of that. And, you know, there's always this tendency to think like, I hear people say like Jay-Z's playing chess and we all playing checkers, like he's 10 moves ahead of us. And if that's the case, I'm looking forward to seeing what the results are gonna be, but uh, I'm, I'm not impressed. And I think Colin is the loser in all of this. And if Jay-Z was gonna make the deal, I wish it would have been contingent upon Colin getting, a, at least he hasn't even gotten a tryout. Like anybody who says otherwise is lying. He hasn't gotten an offer, a tryout, or anything. My, but yeah. my, I'm gonna touch off. My thing is, how can we even go to what's next without Colin? Right. I mean, because the truth is, there would there would not even be a conversation about social justice and police brutality in the, in the NFL without him. Right. And so how I would say sports as a whole. Right. I yeah. Mean, we, he changed the whole. Before, but he changed the landscape. Yeah. And so to move. To move forward in that without him um, is like a, an ego move to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. And again, I think in any other circumstance, I would have nothing but pride that he is now a voice at the table. But this this leaves Colin out of a conversation that he should have been a central part of. and. You know, people say, well, Colin sued the NFL. Well, Eric Reed, he sued the NFL, and he's back in the league. Mm -hmm. Colin could have a chance right now. Like, he still literally is working out five days a week and could still be picked up 
They're oh, there's yeah. no question. I mean, yeah. with the, the quarterbacks in the NFL right now, you can't tell me, even if people want to say he's 30, what is he, 32, 33? No, he just, yeah, just turned 32. Yeah. You can't tell me at least, a, well, he's diminished. You can't tell me at least he can't be a backup. Right. I think he could probably start on some teams. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a Niner fan, sure. so I followed him, yeah. and I was, I was a huge fan of what he was doing on the field. But you can't literally look me in my eyes and say there's not a spot for him in the league. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think any credible commentator or athlete would say otherwise. Right. And so, so knowing that that's the case, this idea that I could still wheel and deal with this league on something different while they ban him, mm -hmm. I just have a problem with it. And... I, I just, I think it was short-sighted. Like, I think people were proud that it seemed like Jay-Z was rocking with Colin, mm -hmm. and then it just seemed like he, he took a different turn, you know? Tell me a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the current situation, which is very time-sensitive, uh, Rodney Reed, and uh, four, 14 days and counting yeah. until he's supposed to be. It was a horrible situation, man. Um, there's a... A, a man in in Texas, outside of Austin, in a town called Bastrop, 30 miles to the east of Austin, who's been in prison for almost 23 years. Man. And in 1996, there was a, a young woman named Stacy Stites who was sexually assaulted and murdered. Horrible. And I, and I just want to put that out there. Like, her family suffered tremendously from this loss. And right away, people believed that it was her fiance, who was a brutal man known for domestic violence. And uh, he was a police officer named Jimmy Fennell. And he was the primary suspect. And nearly a year after Stacey Stice was killed, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Fennell instead uh, was no longer the suspect, and they arrested Rodney Reed. There was no proof that he had anything to do with her murder whatsoever. And if you've ever uh, read the book or hear in New York seen the play To Kill a Mockingbird, it's kind of the same story of, of a white woman who is brutalized by a white man, but a black man takes the fall. And for 22 plus years, Rodney Reed has declared his innocence. And there's so much evidence that exonerates him that the Innocence Project, who's probably the most prestigious organization involved in this, they turn down 95% of the cases that come their way. When they take on a case, they know a man is not guilty. And typically they have DNA evidence to exonerate that man. So the, the Innocence Project is on the case. Uh, it sounds funny, but Dr. Phil McGraw, Dr. Phil yeah, is on it. That's where I saw yeah. And uh, Dr. Phil did two whole episodes on it. Dr. Phil has declared that he also believes Rodney Reed is completely innocent and had nothing to do with this. There are some mechanisms that could potentially free Rodney Reed or at least delay the execution. The governor of Texas, who's a deep conservative, has the power to stay the execution. There's a board of parole there that could also at least delay it or cancel the execution. His sentence could be commuted and he could just be given life in prison and then at least live to be able to fight through the appeals process. I think there's a high likelihood that Rodney Reed will be executed. And all of us are at the point at which we're two weeks away. Uh, of course, there's a high likelihood. We're trying not to think about that, but uh, it's an urgent situation. We've had over a million people sign a petition at freerodneyreed.com and uh, trying to lobby people to intervene any way they can, but it's a... Who needs to hear this for that to happen? It's more, more in Congress hands now, right, you feel? Well, it's not just Congress, it's 95% of all people who are convicted of crimes are convicted on the local and state level. And what that means is Congress and even the president have very little say in what they can do about those cases. So the president of the United States, be it Trump or Obama or anybody, they can pardon people who've been convicted of federal crimes. But in this case, Trump and Congress, the United States Congress, have very little say in how they can help Rodney Reed. It's almost all in the hands of officials there in Texas. Their governor, their state legislature could at least make a statement or do a vote, but even that wouldn't matter. A local district attorney there in the county could remove the death penalty and say, 
we're calling on the death penalty to be removed and just remove it. So it's really in the hands of local conservatives in Texas. And in some ways that's scary because I don't have a lot of influence with conservatives in Texas. And, and yet that's who we need to influence. And so part of what we've tried to do is just make this story go viral. And so we've had people from, uh, from Rihanna to, to both of you to, to other athletes and entertainers and supermodels at the, end of, at the end of the day, conservatives have to care about it. And they've been saying for years that they care about criminal justice reform, and this is their opportunity to, to kind of prove it. And um, 14 days, it's already cutting it way too close. Right. Uh, all of his appeals are not exhausted, but it's, it's, a, it's in a dangerous position right now for sure. I think that it, it doesn't take a scientist to see that you know, we live in a race-driven country. Oh, yeah, man. For, for good and bad reasons. Um, and so it almost seems like what you're doing is is a da obviously a daily thing. Like, how do you find time? How do you, re like, when you take on all this stuff, I mean, because you're, you're educating me daily on, on your post, whether it be a continuous post about one thing or one thing now and two things later tonight. Like, how do you find all the time to, to do all that? And, and well, it's a, my, my life's a mess, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when people ask me, is that I don't have a pretty answer to it. Like, I work too much from, like, I get up on most mornings at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. I have my own daily podcast i go to the studio super early um i have a few hours each day where i'm just spending time with my wife and kids but outside of those few hours and some rest at night i mean i'm i'm pushing hard so i mean i'm working 12 to 14 hours a day every day on most days i feel disappointed because there's somebody who asks me for help and i'm just not able to do it I, I get on an average day hundreds of emails of people who say, can you, can you help my family? Like this week I've gotten emails from people all over the country who said, my father, my son is on death row. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you look into his case? Mm -hmm. Can you do for my son what you're doing for Rodney Reed? And what breaks my heart is I can't. I just, Don't have the time. I on, I'm only able to do but so much in a day. And, um, Part of what I try to do is build systems and organizations that allow me to impact people the best I can, but for me to develop other leaders who can also do what I do. So we have an organization called Real Justice that helps elect district attorneys all over the country. Uh, we have an organization called the Action Pack that's helping lead this piece with Rodney Reed. So we have almost 20 staff members working on this Rodney Reed case right now. So you see me, but behind the scenes, there are 20 of us. And that's, it took 20 of us working around the clock to force this, you know, into the mainstream. But uh, it's hard to manage. It's, it's hard to balance that with family. Right. It's hard to balance that with marriage. And when everything is going well in my life, it's like, it's beautiful and good, but if, one thing goes wrong, uh, like it could be a thing. mess. Right. And I mean, I have all the same problems everybody else has. My wife and I argue like cats and dogs. Uh, sometimes my kids feel like I'm super present. And then other days I'm working so hard that I'm not there the way they need me to be. Mm. So it's, it's hard to balance. And Do you feel pressure? Like you said, you're getting 100 to always have to do something. Like I know you want to. But do you feel the pressure because now you are known as, like I said earlier, like the go-to guy for our culture for this? I mean, I, I do feel the pressure. Um, I, accept, I accept it. I feel, the, I feel the pressure in the sense that there's so much injustice and there's only so little I can do about each case. Right. I, I bumped into a woman a couple of days ago who said, and she and broke my heart. You know, she said, Sean, I've emailed you 40 times. And I literally said, just pull up your phone and show, you know, like I, I, I believed her, but I had never seen this email. Mm -hmm. And she sure enough pulled it up and she had emailed me 
dozens of times asking me to help her in this case. And I hate that that's, that's how we're doing this, that there's so few people to go to that we, I hate that we don't have the systems. I hate that there's so much injustice. Like I, ha I have kids who tell me all the time, they save my email address in their phone. I'm talking about, in case. Yeah, I'm talking about strangers right. who save my email address and s just in case they need to send me something. Huh? I've, seen, I've seen viral videos of police brutality all over the country and I'll hear somebody in the background say, send that to Sean King. Mm -hmm. and, and so all of that, it's a, it is a, a degree of pressure and I try my best every day to, not to keep up with the grind of it, but I, I try to be as productive as I can. It's, it's a lot. How do you handle um, the level of recognition and fame that have come with this? Uh, you know, obviously recently you were honored at Rihanna's uh, Met Gala. Yeah. Um, how do you handle, because I know, you, like I said, you're doing it for the right reasons, but you know, when you do things for the right reasons, stuff happens around you and this happens just to be, you know, obviously your name continuing to grow, your face being more recognizable. How do you handle that? Well, I mean, first and foremost, and we were talking about it earlier, like I have a big family, I have five kids. And so like my family unit is healthy and strong. And so as, as long as that unit there like has my back and is rocking with me, I'm good. Like say, uh, I, my wife is going to kill me for saying all our business, but mm -hmm. my life is so fragile that like, say my wife and I have fallen out, then, then life gets harder for me because it's like, I'm already doing all this work and it's yeah, hard at home. At home. Yeah. Right. And just, just, I just want to be on the record. If, <laughs> if life is a mess at home, it's normally my fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Just to be clear. That's any man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> There's rarely yeah, a problem yeah. in my world that my wife caused is normally me, mm -hmm. but um, the, 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 the fame is def definitely causes a lot of consequences. It puts a lot of pressure on my wife and kids. People recognize them in public. I'm a, her I'm a hermit generally. Like I, I'm, I, I don't go out much. I'm in the office doing the work, uh, at home. Um, you, you know, I also isolate myself from a lot of ugliness. Like I see you guys sometimes like battling people in the comments. Oh man, I got I stay out of comments, man. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I don't know how you do it, man. Like yeah. I can't be in the I can't even the comments in my world yeah. are so ugly. Right? Yeah. yeah, I can't yeah. even look at them, man. Right. And so, but what I do is I kind of protect myself from the ugliness of it all. It's and, hard though. Oh, it is. It's it is. It's 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 something you learn over time. And if I listened. I have enough people in my world, my wife included, who tell me the ugly truth about myself. Like if I make a mistake, I have people who can school me on it and tell me about it. That I don't necessarily need to listen right. to strangers and sure. haters and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I have people in my world who tell me the good, bad, and ugly of yeah, who I am. Yeah, they just as brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, <laughs> I get it all. I get it from people who actually, people who are brutal but love me. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and and so because of that, I'm not super swayed by the hate or the anger of people who don't even know me. Right, you right. Their opinions yeah. don't mean nothing. Yeah, well, right. at least they don't mean anything to me. Right, exactly, <laughs> you exactly. Know? They and, shouldn't. And you know, it's not when people have legitimate critiques of something that I say, or that's one thing, but when people are just being ugly, I have gotten to the point, this isn't even, this isn't even really healthy, but I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of numb to it, mm -hmm. um, where the ugliness just doesn't impact me at all. It's not because I don't care, but I've kind of flipped off a switch where I just can't allow that stuff no, to get to me. But I was telling him, like, the big problem today is people can't have a conversation and disagree without disrespecting each other. Yeah. That's a big problem. Or or online when you disagree with somebody people immediately perceive it as disrespect right exactly and then it then it can spiral over, into over. that and it's over. like hey, we were just we were so sometimes when i like i hardly even disagree with people online publicly anymore because people will take it somewhere yes, weird yes 
But when I do, I'll have to like, it could be, say it's one of you, I may message you private and be like, I hope you know, here's what I'm actually right, thinking. Right, you're saying, yeah, exactly. But now we're in a space where it's it's hard to disagree, man. It's There's weird. There's a lot of idiots with voices, like yeah. Charles Barkley says uh, in the social media space. Tell me what, <clears throat> I saw your wife do a, take over your handle one day, um, defending you, yeah, and then also just saying how hard all this shit is on, on, on the family dynamic side of it. You know, you're out here being a Cape Crusader for the, for the world, but then like you've touched on, like your family is obviously most important to you. Tell me how hard being able to balance both is because I mean, I was someone who went through a public divorce and still, had, like I said, we talked about it on the shows, like, and you're similar to us in the space now as you're kind of professional in this field. So when all the shit is still going on that's rough at home or family, you still have to be you, Sean. You still King. gotta be right. on, right. So tell me what that what that dynamic is like and, and the weight that brings to your family. Well, you know, what my, my wife and I, five years ago when the Black Lives Matter movement first started, I started getting death threats right away. Like mm -hmm. on the phone, in the mail, like we were, we were reporting them to the police, to the FBI, uh, we were getting people who were coming to our home, to our children's school, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I mean, it got bad quick. And so right away, all the way back in 2014, we decided that my wife would basically disappear from social media, that my kids would not be on social media, just to protect them. But it, it unintentionally built something that we didn't really see coming. As people began criticizing me they didn't understand the implications that it would have for my whole family. Right. Mm -hmm. And so people be on social, there are two or three lies that people tell about me all the time. One is that I'm raising money from families and I'm stealing from these families, which is a crime. Like literally it's a federal crime. There are people, you may remember there were these people who claimed they were raising money on GoFundMe for this homeless man, but on the low kept the mm -hmm. money. Those two people are in prison yeah, right now. Prison. Like they are, they are in prison, they each got 10 years. And every time I raise money for families, I, I never see it. It doesn't come through my accounts. It goes directly to these families. Every time I do it, people, I'm talking about real verified blue check accounts are saying he's stealing this money. <laughs> well, what they don't understand is when you say I'm stealing the money, people then look at my wife like, oh, you stealing the money. Oh, you're aware that he's stealing the money. And so she's a professional woman. She's an executive here in New York. And people literally start asking her about this. Mm. And so as people lie about me, they just don't understand that my kids get asked about this stuff. And we live in this culture where it's so easy to just post a random lie on social media that they don't understand the ripple effect and it had gotten so bad and had boiled so far out of control that my wife, who does, who at the time didn't have any social media accounts, was like, "Listen, let me say what I have to say." Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was messy and emotional and it was all of real it. though. Yeah, That's and, what I, yeah, yeah, and it was like it was build up. Yeah, she was. People don't understand that while it's easy for them to get on there and say, "Sean is stealing from families." Sean is a, a white man pretending to be black. As people say these weird things, it has real implications with my family. And um, she just gotten fed up. And so she, so now she is public. She opened up her own Twitter account, her own Instagram account, in part just so people understand like, hey, I'm, I'm a real person with my own views and perspectives, but it's, it's hard, man, for sure. Five beautiful children, and you touched on it briefly. From what are the age? What's the age range? From from six to twenty. Our oldest is in college, and our youngest is in elementary school. What are your knowing how out front you are with the work you do? What are your some of your concerns? Obviously, you know, on a day to day basis with them. Well, man, so much, so much of what I do, I do for my kids, and over these past five years, because we had decided like we wouldn't post about them so much, uh, I never really shared how much that I, I do what I do to fight for them, to advocate for them, hopefully to create a better world for them. Um, 
but, but we go out of our way like we don't even post pictures of the kids on social media anymore and in part because the threats and all of that remain so even though we talk about them um we do little things like don't post full pictures of their face or don't say where they go to school uh in part because i know i can't be there all with the them time. to protect them right. you know so we haven't said where our daughter goes to college mm -hmm. and so little steps that we've taken to kind of protect ourselves mm -hmm. Um, but we have other things that we do to keep each other safe. I mean, we're a, we're a close family, but um, I, I also try to keep the kids off of social media. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, like, please don't search my name on Twitter. Don't search my name on Google. Mm -hmm. These are kids. Like, right. they're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point now where even if they search their own names, they see people talking about me mentioning them, even my little kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a it's a weird climate, man. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. How do you, you know, something that Jack and I as fathers have, have always had to work on is we both came from the streets, you know, got it out the gutter, but our kids will never have to. Right. How do you, compared to how you're growing up now and then the, almost the safety yeah. environment you have to build with your kids, how do you, how, because they probably can't do things other kids can do. It's tricky, you know, like I didn't I didn't grow up in the gutter, but I grew up rough. Mm -hmm. You know, we were we were like a half a step above poor and and didn't even really I never really even understood how broke we were coming up. <laughs> and, you don't nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and so I didn't understand that. And and then I experienced I experienced a lot of hell and trauma growing up. And yet all of that shaped me. It shaped you. It shaped you. Like, I, as I said earlier, I don't even know that you would know who I am had I not been through all of that. And so now our kids, we protect them from all of that. And it has its own implications. Like, uh, it's, you often see the children of successful people sometimes lack drive or determination. So there are little things that we try to do to still help our kids be as determined as we were, even though they don't have the same obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like just making sure that even though they, they are the children of somebody who's well known, that, hey, whatever you get, you're gonna have to, like if, if my kids interview for a job, I'm not calling in advance and saying, hey, mm -hmm. I'm at Sean King, can you help my daughter <laughs> right. get the job, you know? <laughs> like I tell, they still got an interview for it. Like mm -hmm. um, our daughter, we have a daughter in, who's a senior in high school and she's applying for college. And as much as possible, I'm trying to see her do it without me. Right. I'm there to help with the applications, mm -hmm. but I want her to know that when she gets there, it's like, oh, I earned this. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, so it's hard when you grew up rough, it's hard to duplicate the environment that helped make us who we are. And so it's, it's tricky because part of how we became who we are is that we had to overcome so many obstacles. But our kids will have their own obstacles. And uh, yeah, so we just try, I'm trying to see them through it. And, you know, it depends. Like even my youngest kids, I, they don't even really know what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to protect. So our, our daughter who is six, we have a daughter who's 10. They, I don't, I don't even, they don't know about Rodney Reed. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know that I'm fighting for this man who might die in two weeks. In part, I just don't want them to have that. The child brain is not even able to process some of these things. So, I mean, I try to even protect my kids from some of the worst knowledge and information that I see every day. Mm -hmm. What age do you feel with your kids? Because like you said, you do have some in college and headed to college. Do you share some of what you do? Well, man, we, people ask us that all the time because there's, a, there's so much horrible information from videos of police brutality and, and these stories that we're sharing. There's this video that I'm gonna share later today of, uh, of a shooting that, of, and normally when I share a video like that, a family has asked me to share it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sharing it because I want you to see I don't even want to see it. Right. I'm not sharing because I want you to see it. The family knows that 
it getting seen is going to give them leverage to negotiate with police or district attorneys. And um, so we kind of have a sliding scale. Like our daughters who are 20 and 17, they're going to see everything whether I share it with them or not. Mm -hmm. So I try to I try to explain things to them and break it down. My son, who we have four girls and a boy. My son, who's in the middle, he's 13. He's he's a very sensitive boy, and so I may describe the basics of a situation to him, but he, even he's in eighth grade, going into high school, he just couldn't handle seeing these things, and and that's okay. Like my wife doesn't look at right. my wife doesn't my wife doesn't read the articles I write. <laughs> she doesn't look at the posts that I make because it's too much for her. And she supports me, right. but I know that some of this stuff is too much for my son who's 13. Mm -hmm. Now my girls who are 10 and six, uh, I shelter them from it all. Right. Every now and then they may catch that I'm doing, like they know that, I'm, that I fight for people. You know, they know that I'm trying to help people, but I try not to, like some people want their kids to see it all and that's dangerous, actually. Right. Uh, kids don't have... Without explanation, every step. And then, like you said, yeah. as a child, it's hard to fathom how cold this world really is. And what happens, studies show that when young kids see particularly police brutality, they immediately think it's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want my kids to have... It's not that I want them to be ignorant of the danger. We school our kids the best we can. But I don't want them to be having nightmares or unnatural stress of the danger. So even with the safety risk against me, like when I travel out of town, we have security at the house. Mm -hmm. Our older kids know we have security outside of the house, but I don't even want the younger kids to know that right. there is a risk here that they that we need somebody standing at the front door. And so we, we kind of have a, a age an age sliding scale where mm -hmm. the little kids know next to nothing and depend on how old they are we share more and more what's the best part about being a dad i mean we've talked about the tough side and the oh, worrisome yeah. side tell me the side that makes you smile oh man i love being a dad you know i, I, was, I was telling jack you know i've been a i've been a dad my whole adult life and you have too mm -hmm. and uh my wife and i were 19 and 20 years old when we were you 19 you, when you became 19. Mm -hmm. yeah we were in college and young and dumb and broke and struggling and all of that but i've been a dad my whole adult life so i literally don't know adulthood without being a dad <laughs> like it's all it's all i've ever been and so um i love spending time with the kids like one there you know before you have kids you assume they're gonna be like you in some kind of way all five of my kids are totally different from each other mm -hmm. they're very different than me they have skills that I've never had, gifts that I've never had. So it's beautiful just to see them becoming their own unique people. Um, they've taken on some of the things, like I love movies and sports, and they've taken on the love of movies and sports. Um, my 13-year-old son and I are playing an NBA fantasy league together this year. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I've done fantasy basketball in 10 or 15 years but I just wanted to make sure that we were engaging on some kind of level. Mm -hmm. And so just little things like that, man. But um, they don't see me at all. When they come home, they don't see me as famous or they, they ne and they never would. It's like, your dad, your dad. yeah, I'm just dad. Right. And so home for me is normal. I'm taking out the garbage and cleaning the house and, <laughs> and turning on the alarm. And so home is like the place where there's normalcy for all of us, and uh, and it's a beautiful thing. So I mean, I again, I know that no matter how crazy the world is, that I got this unit at home that has my back and is gonna rock with me no matter what. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I mean, your your job seems to never end. What do you do to unplug and decompress? How do you chill out, or do you? <laughs> I don't chill out much. Um, There's like no days or no certain time well, where know, I'm not doing nothing right now. Well, I, I do a couple things. Like one, I love what I do. As hard as it is, as hard as 
fighting for justice for Rodney Reed, as hard as all of that stuff is, I do it because I love doing right. it. Right. So even even if I'm doing it late, like I was, I pulled even on the way over here today, I pulled the car over because I had to respond to something. But it's what I want to do. I chose this life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's how I want to live my life. So even though the work is hard and it's a grind, it doesn't wear me down. Like I look forward to being able to to help people to tell these stories. So my work, it never quite feels like work. And people say that, but it, I mean, I hope I hope that for everybody. If you can, you love what you're doing. Yeah, you have work a day in your life. And that's true for me, man. Like. Everybody doesn't get to do that. Like my mother made light bulbs for 40 years and I talked with her. I mean, she told me that there wasn't a day she made a light bulb, she liked it. Mm -hmm. You know, like she hated all 40 years of mm -hmm. it. She said someday she liked the people there. Right. She was like, no, nah, I never enjoyed making the light bulbs. You know, it was nothing in it. Mm -hmm. And I hope for my kids and other, for anybody who's watching, I hope that they get to do something that they love. But uh, I watch sports. I'm a, I'm a huge NBA fan. Uh, Favorite team? Uh, I'm, I'm a Nets guy. We live in Brooklyn, so I'm rooting okay. for the Nets. Okay. We were rooting for the Nets before they signed Kyrie and KD. And mm -hmm. You was rooting for the Nets when I was there? Uh -huh, yeah, man. We've been loving, <laughs> we've been loving the Nets, man. No, we love, no we've, we've been here in Brooklyn. We were in Brooklyn for almost four years now. And uh, we love the Nets, man. And, like, it's just our hometown team. But, I mean, we have all types of teams that, We've moved all over the country. So when we lived in California, we were rooting for Golden State and rooting for the Lakers. Mm -hmm. We lived in Atlanta for 10 years. We were rooting for the Hawks. So I'm a homer. Like, wherever I live, I kind of root for the home team. Yeah, right. smart. And uh, so I grew up in Kentucky where we didn't have a pro team. And so uh, we go to the movies all the time. And uh, What type of movies you like? Because you have a certain line of work. Do you try to get away from that and just well, you know, comedy? Or? Well, the tricky, the hardest okay. thing that sucks is because we have a six-year-old in yeah. the house, like it's hard to take the whole family to the movie and see something that I actually like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, um, so me and my wife go out, like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we see it all, man. I mean, I go to the movies three or four times a month. Okay. And uh, so whatever's out, we try to check it out. And uh, I'm watching, uh, I watch a couple shows on iTunes and Netflix. I'm watching this new show, uh, 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 Yellowstone. It's a like a western with uh, Kevin Costner, and I've been checking that out. And people ask me like, "Well, when do I watch it?" Like, if I'm on the subway, I put my uh, put my headphones on and steal a couple minutes there to watch it. But I mean, I, I try to I try to decompress when I can. Um, uh, you know, we travel as much as we can. Like, we'll we'll go somewhere during the Christmas holiday. That's at least once a year, we take a big family trip together and get away. And um, last year, we went to Hawaii or we go to Jamaica or something like that, okay. just to just to go somewhere where the weather is warmer than it is here in New York. Now, do you are you are you off are you offline when you're on family vacation, you or remove. do you still got to work? Uh, like well, I try to be. Um, like we um, this past Christmas, we went to Hawaii. And my whole family made me promise that I would stay offline. Right, right. And you may remember this young girl named Jasmine Barnes, a seven-year-old girl mm -hmm. in Houston was shot right. and killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been away for two or three days and people started asking me if I would help find who killed this young girl. And my family was like, don't you do that. You know, <laughs> my wife and my kids. And I kept my promise for a couple of days and then finally people who were very close to the family reached out to me and I interrupted my vacation and time with family to do it. And uh, I, I wish I hadn't, you know, like that's a dilemma that I'm in all the time where my family needed me to just say no, even though people really wanted and needed me to help in that situation. Your heart is so big, you can't, it's just only so long. But I jam can. myself up though, you know, like, um, you know, I ended up hurting my family because I basically stopped my, my family was still on vacation, but for the final two or three days, all I did was throw myself into this case. And uh, I learned a lot from that. Like, I, I hope this holiday when I go away, I, I might just, I might not even take my phone. I have to be unplugged from the world. Yeah. You got to reboot, man. Yeah. You do a lot. You got to reboot yeah. it. Yeah. So where do we go from here? 
Like, what is your message? Like, what, what, I mean, obviously, you know, with, with, with the presidency and, 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 the, and the state of, of race, what it is, people bother me when they say it's not about everything. A lot of stuff is centered around race. Where do you think we go from here as a culture? As a, as, well, as one? I, do ha I do have hope. And uh, even with all the ugliness that I see every day, there are a couple reasons why I have hope. Like, no matter how ugly things get in the world, and we're talking about a world that can that can get deep and dirty and ugly. We're talking about a world that had the Holocaust, right. a world that had the transatlantic slave trade. Right. We're talking about a world, like when people say, Sean, can it get worse? My answer is always, no oh, question. hell yeah. No question. It can get a lot worse. But anytime things have gotten horrible and ugly all throughout history, I'm a historian by training. My undergraduate and graduate degrees are in history people always bounce back. Societies always recover, no matter how ugly, how dirty, how horrible, how desperate things can get. The pendulum, it may swing one way, but it will always swing the other way. Now, what I need to explain to people is that, that pendulum illustration has limitations. It doesn't, people swing it back. And so whatever we're going to see next in this world, like when we think about slavery in America that lasted for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. people fought to end that. Like it didn't just end. Right. Like it didn't just say we're done. Like right. there was a civil war for that. Mm -hmm. And so whatever it is, if it's voting rights, if it's civil rights, whatever future it is we want to see in this country, we will only see what we fight for. And I try to explain to people, whatever future it is that we want for this country, we have to organize ourselves into it. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. And I wish it. I wish it just things got better naturally, but that's just not how it goes. Right. And um, you think we're heading in the right direction? No, no, I don't. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, that was quick. I'm confident that we're not. I'm actually. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I think these next couple years could be real rough for us. Uh, what, what you're going to see next? Next month and over the next two or three months, the impeachment of the president is going to happen. Those proceedings, uh, this isn't theoretical. The, the impeachment proceedings are going to move forward. I believe the president will be impeached in the House, and I think that could get real volatile. Um, I think the election could be very volatile and dangerous. I, I, I could imagine a scenario where Donald Trump loses the election and decides not to leave the office mm. because he thinks it's not official or not legitimate. Mm. Um, we're already in a scenario where the Congress has subpoenaed, a legal subpoena has subpoenaed people to testify and they just said no. Like there are people in prison right now for failure to comply to a subpoena. You go to jail for that. And so we're already at a showdown I think the United States right now is in a much more fragile place than we understand. I agree. Um, I'm, con I'm deeply concerned. And I, um, I hear not just the president, but others even talk about civil war and violence. And that type of stuff, it concerns me, man. I mean, it makes me, uh, it makes me concerned about what's next. And, and I don't know. I think... Um, I think things will get worse before they get better. And, and I don't think, I don't think all of our problems are just solved even by this one election. Right. Um, in Donald Trump's defense, many of our greatest problems in this country, he didn't create them. Right. And so even if he does, even if he does lose, even if he does leave the office peacefully, there's still mass incarceration. He didn't build that. You know, there's still issues of poverty and other things. So now I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about where we go next. And I say that as somebody who studies it day in and day out, um, I think we've grown a bit used to things that we probably should never have grown used to. And there's some things that have been normalized in this country that, that are deeply problematic. So I'm worried about these next few months. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm watching carefully, but I'm, I'm not even quick to get nervous, but it's a it's a weird time. Yeah, it's gonna be real touchy. Yeah, it's um, I I'm friends with several people who are in Congress, and 
even Congress people understand that this a, we're walking on thin ice right now. Like say, say those people who have been subpoenaed, say Congress then threatens to jail those people. But say those people then say, well, you're not taking me to jail. What's gonna what's gonna happen here? Like how what what's are we then gonna force them into and cart like I don't know. Like even people in Congress know it's like it's uh It's an uncharted territory. Yeah. I mean, typically you get a subpoena, You're you go, show up. Yeah, and if you don't, it's simple, you go to jail. Yeah, and so we're testing those norms and and so for the first time we realized like, oh, there wasn't really a system in place to enforce the rules on the presidency and on the administration. And uh, daily, Trump and the administration are pushing those boundaries in a way that I think are gonna be hard to dial back in one way or the other. What would be your message to the youth to get out there and, 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 and you know, uh, every, it's cool to talk about it. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about outside of social media to talk about it and do yeah. this and do that. How can they be, what would be your message to make them be a part of it? You know, really make their voice count. What would you say to the kids? Well, you know what, man? Th today's generation of young people are already way more active than we were when we no were question. kids. Yeah. No I, I was explaining to my kids just last night, when I was in high, there were no activists at my high school. Like, I didn't even know that was an option. Right. Like, you could care, but you, there, I, there were no activists at my high school. Like, that's not how we saw the world. And... Today, even my daughter who's in college or in high school, they see themselves as activists. And not just because they're my children. Like, he, here in New York, my kids, even my kids in elementary and middle school have been to marches and protests. Like, we didn't, we didn't do that growing up. Mm -mm. So this generation, I, I trust them more than I trust our generation. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they understand the danger a little more in part because they also, and I don't even mean this as a knock, because they don't have to pay the bills, because they don't have all the responsibilities as adults, they get to see the world for for all that it is and isn't in a way that's just very different. And so like there are days where I there might be a protest in the city, but because I have a nine to five, I just can't go. Well, kids don't have that same burden in that sense. And uh, they're laying it all on the line, man. Like, I am, on most days, more inspired by them. And uh, I could tell you, I mean, there are, there are kids fighting for, uh, fighting against the climate crisis, fighting against police brutality, gun violence, that I would say are, they are the ones leading on it. In most rooms that I go in, I'm the old man in the room. <laughs> like I've been in rooms, I'm talking about with like the best leaders in the country. My In my brain, I haven't started thinking of myself as old yet. And I realized right away, it's like, oh, they think I'm old. Like people calling me Mr. King or Uncle Sean. It's like, oh, hold, hold on, hold <laughs> on, hold on. And I realized it's like, you gotta think, how did you see somebody who was 40 when you were 18? Oh, yeah. When old. you were 20. Old. Yeah, you saw. And so I realized it's like, listen, these young people, I'm proud of them. They, in the 2018 election, they voted more than any young generation in American history. So they're not perfect. Um, I used to think when we were kids, I used to think that racism would pretty much die out when all the old racists died. But They're teaching them at a young age. Nah, yeah. so, so even though I'm proud of young people, some of the worst racists in America now are, are teenagers young. and young adults. No question. Mm -hmm. And they're full on white supremacists and neo Nazis. But don't know why. Yeah, couldn't couldn't break it down if you sat they here with them and tell pushed you them nothing. Hard. Like, why don't you like? Right. Because my mom and dad told me. You know what I mean? Right. Like that shit. Will Sean King ever feel accomplished? Um, I don't know, man. You know, I, I'm. I'm always pushing it, you know. Um, I used to, there's a, a writer, Ta-Nehisi Coates. When I used to read Ta-Nehisi Coates stuff, I used to think he was super pessimistic. He used to talk about how things like racism and stuff would always be here. And I, as a young optimist, I would see that and be like, man, why is he so negative? 
And as I've gotten a little older, I've grown to think a lot of the worst parts of this country, they'll change their shape and form, but they'll always be here. So I think to the day I die, I'm gonna always be fighting back against injustice. Um, you know, there are, there are single battles that I hope we win. Today is election day around the country. There are a couple candidates that I've been fighting for. And so I feel accomplished in a sense that um, there are some battles I hope we win, but um, one of my heroes is Harry Belafonte, who's now in his mid nineties and is still fighting for justice and change today. I hosted a conversation with him last year and he showed up with a Trayvon hoodie. Mm -hmm. about a 94 year old man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I asked him about why he had on the hoodie. And he said, uh, as long as George Zimmerman is walking around, I'm gonna wear this hoodie. Mm. And it's a 94 year old man. Mm -hmm. And I saw that was like, that's who I, I want to be the 94 year old man wearing the hoodie, you know? Mm -hmm. I, wish, I wish we didn't need to wear the hoodie. I wish I, wish, I wish I could work myself out of a job, but I'm convinced that a lot of our problems are gonna be here for a very long time. So um, it's, it's a marathon. I know we all love Nipsey and- Rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> I think part of what I think about when I think about Nipsey is also saying, hey, there's some things I'm gonna fight for today but there's some things I'm fighting for now, knowing we won't see the fruits for 10, 20, or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And and as I get older, I'm able to see that a little more clearly. And so um, some systems are gonna take a lifetime for us to see, see the change, for sure. Mm. Sean, man, we yeah. appreciate your time. Thank y'all, man, appreciate Thank you. you. Man, pleasure. Yeah, tell our, tell, you, tell man. our audience where, we, where they can find you at. Sure, I mean, right now people can go to freerodneyreed.com and that's where my mind is and where my heart is. As soon as I leave here, I'm checking on that and seeing what progress we've made. We're down to the wire with 14 days to save this man's life. You can check me out at Sean King on every social media platform. I also have a daily news podcast called The Breakdown. I'm recording that. Just FYI, if anybody ever asks you to do a daily news podcast, say no. It's every day. It's hard, man. <laughs> oh, man, it's hard. Can't it's a beast. It. Right. It's a, it is a grind. And so uh, I love it, but it's so hard to do. That's on every podcast platform. Check that out. We're talking about Rodney Reed's case yeah. every day for the next 14 days on there. Um, I have a book that's coming out. We just released the website today. It doesn't come out to April. The book's called Make Change. So you can go to makechangebook.com to check that out. And uh, I'm always building, always tinkering, always trying to empower people to make a difference. So I'm gonna keep on pushing. Free Rodney Reed, man. Yeah. If you had, last thing, yeah. a message to the world that would go around on the billboard, one word or a sentence, what would that be? Oh man, we, we know so much of so much of my mind is, is about Rodney Reed, but, um, I would, I would probably say, do something. Um, do something. So much, so much energy is spent thinking about doing something, talking about doing something. Mm -hmm. um, you learn more from just getting out there and actually doing something. And and so I tell people all the time, your issue does not have to be my issue. My issue doesn't have to be yours. So I'm fighting against police brutality and mass incarceration your thing might be something altogether different, but do something. And your something doesn't have to be mine, but you don't wanna look back on your life and your good years wishing you had done something. So yeah, I would say do something, get out there and do it. No doubt. Nice. That's a wrap, episode three, All the Smoke. We wanna thank Sean King for coming through and educating us and sharing his story. And uh, you know, you guys can find us on uh, Showtime Basketball YouTube channel and all platforms to stream podcasts. Jack, you got anything? My boy gave me some Malcolm and some uh, Martin Luther King vibes, man. I'm getting chills from him. I learned a lot today, so that's why I was kind of quiet. I learned a lot today. Yeah. See y'all next time.